So what we're going to uh, uh, run through a little bit again is the uh, kind of a fast overview of the, the physiology involved and so that I can just see the screen and know which screen you're looking at. I will uh, walk out here and say that we're looking now at the uh, scan of the attachment systems in the brain. The, the central green part would be the thalamus. Uh, that's pretty much where the information first starts its processing, comes up the brain stem. Uh, the most of the value systems in the brain are down in the brain stem, and we talked about them briefly, but they're influencing now. They've seen something go by that they think is what should be examined for personal relevance. If it's personal, uh, the thalamus tends to respond. And then the little green spot in front of that um, is part of the basal ganglion, which often is uh, referred to as the pleasure center in the brain, uh, where the addictions and stuff like that take, uh, take shape. Um, every time we look at it, we find even more complex functions going on in there than we thought were there before. But basically what it's looking for is uh, this little burst of activity that says, um, yeah, this is an important person to me. This is an important something to me. So if something important comes along, it gets that little burst from the, the attachment center right there. Then the amygdala, who we've looked at, uh, talked about a little bit before, level two, this is a good, bad, and scary opinion. And it's connected out with all of the brain's uh, library systems and stuff like that. Um, it has um, um, pretty much a, a day and night on these two levels are on running most of the, most of the time. Um, in fact, I think it's almost safe to say all of the time. Then we get up to level three, which is the cingulate. And the information there uh, is, you know, sort of starts out in the back and it works its way around to the front. So it's, a, it's kind of this sweep of information is moving the information together. Now, as we're talking about the cingulate, that's where you get the mutual mind state. Uh, are you familiar with that term or is that kind of, who's, it, who's new to the term mutual mind state? Here we've got enough people here to stop and, and talk about it. Um, earlier we called it contingent communication and we also called it intersubjectivity. But mutual mind state is that state in which we're quite sure, uh, you know, we're thinking the same thing or we understand each other. It doesn't necessarily mean we agree, but like right now, I was watching you nod your head, Jim, and if I were properly in a mutual mind state, I'm thinking he's agreeing with me. It might mean that his neck was itchy <laughs> and I completely misread it, right? Uh, he's trying to scratch it on the back of his collar, but uh, because of his smile and a variety of all these other cues, I'm thinking there is a mind behind that face, and I know what, what's going on in that mind right now. And if I'm right, and about five months of age is when this capacity develops, I'm able to get a, a fairly good idea of what's going on with your mind by having the same responses inside mine that you're having right now and we, we understand each other. Have you ever been talking to a child who didn't have mutual mind state going with you and you said, now look at me in my eyes and, and somehow or another you know when they finally understood what you're trying to say to them, you know, right? Because you said it's for, it goes faster than conscious mind but somehow you know that child is not tuning into what I'm saying right now or you, you understand, right? You, you are not to bite your brother. <laughs> really not to bite your brother. Uh, whatever it is, you know, this is a mutual mind state. You don't have to have a lot of language going on there. They don't have to narrate back to you. All, well, mother, I hear you saying that in your estimation, my putting my teeth on my brother and leaving holes is not really giving you pleasure. No, you don't have to know all that. You go like, it will be, we pick up on these cues. We, we have got mutual mind state going. It's a, a state 
that all of us know and almost no language in the world has a word for it. So, you know, we, we try to talk about it like we understand it. We also call it intuition. Like someone is talking and I hear what you're saying, but I'm tracking your mind and I know you're lying to me. Because it runs faster than the conscious mind and it sends off little signals. In fact, if you want to be an extremely good liar, the only way that you can actually block mutual mind state is by acting very angry. So if you put an extremely angry look on your face, you block so many signals that no one can actually track what's going on in your mind. So you can actually lie effectively about anything without, I mean, you can tell something that's so stupid no one will believe you, it doesn't mean that. But no one can track that you're lying because you've got such a massively angry over, overlay. And so people who actually want to uh, con other people will get angry so that you can't really read any of their signals. And it's uh, a <clears throat> case you need to con somebody if you've just been given a hint. But anyway, this, the yellow part right there, which we've ended up calling the mental banana simply because uh, the first time that we did this diagram, we painted it yellow. And then someone says, oh, it looks like a banana. Uh, <laughs> this is also the part of your mind that is most susceptible to poison. So heavy metal poisoning, lead poisoning, any kind of poisoning will affect this part of the brain, the, the yellow part, uh, before any other. F and if you have a closed head trauma injury, this is the part of the brain most susceptible to being injured. In fact, almost any kind of damage that can happen. If you have a, a stroke any place in your brain, the place where the damage will always show up is in this yellow section. Because it's actually a consolidation center. Most of the functions that we use for mutual mind state don't actually happen in that yellow region. They're happening all other kinds of part of your brain, but the yellow region is the part that puts it together so that it means something to you right now at the right time. It's the, it's the you know, everything comes together right here. So it's done lots of other places. Uh, and one of the things that sort of throws people off track some places, you said this and this and this all happened in the cingulate cortex, which is that yellow region. I said, well, now if you listen to me really carefully, I didn't say it happened there. But it, that's where its effectiveness shows up. So, you know, if that region is damaged or off, and most often when it's off, it's actually not off. <laughs> so, what happens in this region is you get too much input, it cramps on you. It's, it's not off, it's on. It's too far on, it can't rest, it can't quiet itself. So when this region's in trouble, it doesn't go dark you know, no activity. It goes way too high and it can't calm down. And then, if you ever try to run or do anything with a cramp, you realize that muscle is not working for you. So not, the information is not getting through, not because it's gone to sleep someplace, but because the levels have gotten way too high and now nothing is, you know, uh, it's sort of like if you ever turned up a, an amplifier way too high and all the sound just went to, you know, screechy static uh, kind of, uh, you know, fuzz, you know, and you couldn't make out what it was saying anymore because it was just, you know, that's what happens to your signal at that level. It just starts, you know, your thoughts start turning into this scrambled fuzz because it's way too intense. So what you want to <coughs> typically do is to quiet this part of the brain. And the value system that does the brain's quieting for it is the serotonin system, right. So this idea of alternating between joy, which is a high level, and then serotonin, which is a quiet level, is the thing that keeps this part of our brain tuned in with each other people. If you are interacting with anyone and they leave the volume up too long, and too long for your brain is generally the six to 10 seconds, Right, and run that back. Because I often say to people, well, practice smiling with somebody else. Six to 10 seconds from now, they'll be tired of smiling at you. You've got to quiet down, you've got to give them a break. Then they'll want to smile with you again. And they want, but six to 10 seconds later, that's, that's enough. 
So the, this, uh, you know, this back and forth, quiet smile, quiet smile, you'll do that all, all the time you possibly can. A child who's nine months old will spend up to eight hours a day doing this with somebody if they give them a chance. Develop actually the most powerful nervous system you can get at that age because it's when it's growing the most and it will produce lots of joy signals and lots of quiet signals. Now, for the rest of your life, every time something is upsetting you or getting you excited, what you use is your serotonin system to quiet yourself down so you can keep yourself in a workable range. You don't cramp up. So by practicing lots and lots and lots and lots of joy and quiet, um, <coughs> you end up with this this wonderful internal control that says, yeah, I can have high energy, I can have low energy, and I can track yours. Because it's this mutual mind state. I do it by going up and down with you. And it starts by having the better, the stronger, the, the older brain, hopefully, the, uh, help the younger one both to feel some joy, but more importantly, to have enough time to quiet down. So it's really easy to get most people to smile, or most children to smile. It's much harder to get them to quiet down out of, out of any kind of a state. So that's actually the side you have to work more. You have to leave longer time for quieting than you do for joy part, if you want to be joyful. I mean, it seems sort of paradoxing, paradoxical, but this is a system that regulates it. So, um, again, it is the most susceptible to damage of any sort, physical damage, uh, you know, head, like I said, closed head trauma, poison, all these, uh, even strokes, they all begin to impact the system because it's where all the signals come together and they have to be there at the right time and the right amount, uh, right strength and right relationship with everything else or things jam up, they don't go through. And what people do if this jams up, especially at the front end, um, Anytime you find somebody who's oppositional defiant, it's always the front end of this that's, that's in a cramp. <coughs> because that's the part that lets you coordinate your energy with what somebody else wants to do. So I have to know how badly you want to do it, and when you want to do it right now, and feel like who I am and my, what I want to do, I want to add to you. But you're, all those functions have to be going together. Otherwise, I just say, you're pushing me. And if you're pushing me, I'm, I'm resisting. Very interesting thing also in the, in the front is that that's the part of the brain that provides your motivation for doing everything. So when it cramps up, my motivation stops working. Uh, interesting thing that was done with chronic pain. Uh, are you the one that was working with the pain? Okay. You're probably familiar with this and you probably know why I don't like this solution. But one of the things they could did with chronic pain was they decided if they ablated, they cut out that front part of the brain, uh, people were no longer bothered by chronic pain. Now they asked them, does it hurt? Yeah, it says it hurts as much as ever. But I don't care. So what disappeared was not the pain, but my caring about it. It doesn't motivate me, it doesn't do anything to me. I one time was taking nitrous oxide with this dentist, and he got me just the right level that I, he knocked out that part of my, my brain and he extracted a tooth and it hurt just the most dramatic, painful tooth extraction. I could care less. I'm like, huh, wow, I've never felt anything as painful as that. And I didn't. <laughs> yeah, you could have gotten me to laugh or whatever else you wanted right there. Like, I could care less. But I felt ex every bit of detail of that extraction that you want to have is just, you know, just the perfect amount of knocking out my do I care about it at all? So you'll notice that there's a lot of people who are actually depressed or something else, and they don't seem to care about life or what's going on. And if you scan them, you're almost always certain to find that this part of the brain is in a cramp. Uh, so if they did care, the signal isn't getting through. It feels like, yeah, so what do I care? Sociopaths obviously have that blocked for whether what happens to you, I don't care hurts. I can see that. Do I care? Yeah. Don't share any of that with you. So these are all functions, but remember this is where they're consolidated. It's not where they actually may be done or originate. And then when all of that's done, it gets up to the right orbital prefrontal cortex, which 
I think most of us know is nothing more than a street address. Right means it's on the right side. Orbital means it's by the socket or orbit of your eye. Prefrontal means it's not quite to the front. <laughs> and cortex means it's on the outside. So when you get done with all of that, on the right side, not all the way to the front near your eye, eh, on the outside of your brain, there's a spot. But it sounds so much better when you say right orbital prefrontal cortex, right? And, and, but then the other thing about neurologists is that they have a variety of different ways of calling the same thing. So they could call it the orbital frontal cortex. Uh, and you know, some of you came in a car and some of you came in an automobile <laughs> and some of you came in a vehicle. And when we look at, think of those words, we all think, oh yeah, well, it's all the same thing, right? Uh, and neurologists use these terms interchangeably. They know it's all the same thing, but those of us on the outside that are trying to figure out what they're talking about, when they say, well, this person said it was the orbital frontal cortex, and this one said the orbital prefrontal cortex, and that, that the other, and there's more terms than that, you see. And some people will say, well, that's, you know, you're just talking about the limbic system. And others will say, well, that's outside the limbic system. And, and the, because again, that even when you're talking about different terms, not necessarily everybody uses the same limits. Like, is the, does the limbic system stop right here at, the, at a gyrus, or does it continue around here? Well, depending on your school of thought, you might say, well, no, I include this in the limbic <coughs> system, or another one would say, well, I don't include it. That's actually the, <coughs> the higher brain function. And so, again, we, when we're trying to discuss these things, we stay with things like the mental banana. <laughs> Um, because it, it's close enough for what we're trying to do to figure out how, you, how do you actually track this through the brain. So now we went to the mutual mind, back again to that context. The cingulate cortex is the, the most important function in the mutual mind. Obviously you will have no mutual mind state if I don't identify you as important. And so the attachment level never sends a signal through that you're here. I have to somehow realize you're here or I won't have a mutual mind state, right? But uh, for, the, for our functions, we're just gonna talk about what it means to do that. It's that mutual mind state that runs at six cycles per second. So when we're talking about the fast track of the brain, which you've all been hearing about, right? we actually mean exactly the same thing as a mutual mind state, the part that does the mutual mind state. This is the same part that lets us learn how to relate uh, to other people and interact with them and be relational because we're tracking each other's brain at this speed that's faster than conscious mind is running. But we're now on the same track, we're understanding each other, we're feeling connected, we're intuitively, all these words we use to describe like, our mutual mind state is running really smoothly and I'm, I'm feeling with you and tracking with you and understanding with you and getting how big something is for you and how unimportant something is for you and you're doing the same thing for me. Uh, and we're doing it so smoothly that um, you can't tell whether I'm following you or, you can't, or you're following me. We're just doing this together. And when you're doing that, you are now producing a group mind. And the group mind actually has enough characteristics to it that it's more than just a nice term for it. If during this time of mutual mind, I happen to think of something painful to me, I will not only have my capacity to deal with it, but I'll have your capacity to deal with it. Not prep, not 100%, but what you can do to stay with me adds to my ability to stay with this without cramping up myself. In particular, because I know I'm not alone, is maybe how I might think about it, but I actually I have more capac dynamic capacity to process the signals of upset because I'm using your mind to help bring me up and down and up and down and you are sort of balancing me as I'm thinking through this. This is why so many times something that I couldn't think about or process by myself, if I could find somebody that would just understand and listen and connect with me, and it's never in the words, right? It's, you know, they, they understood. Is this like empathy? <clears throat> yes. 
Mm -hmm. That's another word for it. Except that empathy, uh, it's hard to understand empathy dynamically enough. But it, it is what we're talking about, empathy. Because um, empathy, we often think of limited limit it to, I, I know what you're having for feeling. But this is, you know, this is the full-bodied empathy, you might say. You know, we're actually sharing the same experience together. I'm going through, through it with you. And that's, uh, to some degree, how I read Paul saying, uh, how can you go and be with a prostitute? Don't you know that Christ is so attuned with your mind that if you go to be with a prostitute, you're making Jesus go through that experience with you because he won't leave you. And how can you make Jesus do that to a prostitute? You can force him to do it because he won't leave you. But think about it. You really seriously? Because he's so attuned with your mind, he's going to have to go through this experience with you. You're going to look at pornography really seriously? Jesus is going to go through the whole experience with you because he's going to be a mutual mind state with you. You're going to be trying to ignore that, but it isn't going to work for him. You re Really seriously, you want to do this? Now let, let's just stop a minute and be aware that he's with you there. Because if you're going to do it, you might as well be aware that he's with you right there. And you're pulling him, dragging him through what's about to happen right here. Okay? So you want to get in tune with all of that. You know, the interesting thing is as soon as men start, or women, because by now in, in England, the rates for pornography are the same between men and women, and it's expected very quickly that women will be ahead of the men. But if you're, going, if you're going to do that, once you start bringing Jesus through it and you're aware of Jesus in that mutual mind state, you know the appeal of this thing just drops off dramatically. It's like, I don't think I want to keep doing this. Because now I'm starting to be aware of what Jesus is going through as I'm going, as I'm dragging him through this. It's all fine while I ignored it and I thought I was by myself, but I'm not. So we have a very dynamic kind of a situation here with this fast track of the mind. It has um, control priority over conscious thoughts, so we can't ever keep up. But here's a, again. Uh, an interesting principle, and that is that the more synchronized or alike our minds are, the less I can tell who's thinking. So, uh, one of the most common things that happens, for instance, is we do mutual mind state, my wife and I, around being angry. And we don't know who started it exactly, but I know I didn't mean to, and she knows she didn't mean to. But whatever it is that happened within, again, those six seconds generally, we're both pretty mad. And if you ask her, she said, well, you made me mad. And I will say to her, no, you made me mad. When actually our mutual mind state was amplifying what was happening between us and we made us mad. <laughs> but because we know that none of us willfully or intentionally was trying to do it, uh, the best we can explain is it must have been something you were doing to me because I wasn't trying to do that to you. But since it's so mutual, right? The same thing that happens uh, is that um, when we're trying to think God's thoughts and we're using a mutual mind state, we cannot tell whether it was God thinking or us thinking. It's so much like us thinking that it's like, I don't know if this is God or if this is me. That's actually not bad, that's the goal. We want to get to the point, you ever want to get a, to a relationship with somebody what, close enough that you could actually cut the track and you'd feel through light, you'd have the same reactions together? You know, it's like, you know, I feel the same way about my children that you feel about your children. You know, you feel the same way about, you know, we have these mutual experiences. We think, wow, this is a good relationship. We just, you know, we just feel together the same way. We, we think the same way. We respond the same way. That's what God is doing with us if he uses the mutual mind system. In the end, we will be thinking so much like he is right now, feeling so much like God is right now, that we won't know if it was us or him. In which case, neither will anyone on the outside. And that is actually perfect. But for the average Christian, who now doesn't know if it's me or God, because I couldn't keep up with this consciously, we used to get all this anxiety, like, well, how can I know? You mean consciously? Nope, impossible, can't do it. 
can your right hemisphere know? Does it feel peaceful? Does it feel joyful? Do you feel glad for God's presence right now? And you're still thinking that? Well, there's a pretty good chance then that God's mind is, is working with you and that way it's coming out of you has a lot of God content in it. Now, who else has got contact with God's mind right now? Let's look at them and on their faces and see if they're getting the same message and same understanding and they're, you know, you're connected with God, you're connected with God, you're hearing this, so all of us together. Now, our, my mutual mind can do with only one person. But if we're all doing the same person and we're getting the same signal, then when you put it all together, so we're all peaceful, we're all joyful, we're all feeling connected with God, we all want to thank Him for this, pretty good chance that what we're thinking now as a people is pretty close to what God's thinking. And that's actually how we're supposed to function. Whenever we lose our peace, we go, uh-oh, someone's lost the signal. Let's help them get it back. Right? That's a different way of lifting, living this out. But it, it's, <coughs> it's what happens if God uses the fast track and this mutual mind system. Now, if we go on to say that the mutual mind system is the only system that's capable of changing our identities so we can become a new person, I'm even more interested in whether God's going to use it or not. And you see where this is going different than common theology? Because common theology wants to run at the conscious rate, where we can double check all of our facts and make sure that we've got all of the information right and we've got data overlap and conclusion overlap and all that sort of stuff. And that's good for error checking, but it's not, if we're not getting the kind of identity change that we need, we should use that system to make sure that we figure out why we're not getting identity change. But my guess is that God didn't design the system just so that we would have better emotional experiences and then not plan to use it himself to build up our identities the way he designed it so that our parents could build up our identities. It just makes no sense to me. Now I can't give you a Bible verse exactly to prove that. But what happens when you're doing a mutual mind state is it shapes the new mind in us based on who we love and share mutual time together. So because we're running this too fast and we're sharing this overlapping, I start getting the same responses to things that you do. If I share time with my wife enjoying the stuff that she enjoys, just like my daughter-in-law throws up to the blue cup now, I start to respond with joy and appreciation and to the things that my wife enjoys and appreciates because I'm doing a mutual mind share with her and my brain starts doing the same chemistry, right? So when I went to meet her family, who I'd never met before, right, because we just get married, right? All of these faces are strangers to me, right? <coughs> Will my dopamine system go, yeah? Look at you, it's, it's Aunt whoever, what? <laughs> like, who's that? But if I'm tracking the dopamine system that I'm, I, I'm in love with, when I watch her response to that aunt, something in me starts going, wow, she, those two really like each other. I'm drawn into it. It's like, it isn't too long before, if I follow this and I keep going through this pattern, every time I see that ant, my face starts to get a smile. And it's not just because I'm trying to put one on, it's like it's there. It's like, oh, there she, Aunt Minnie. And you know, Aunt Minnie became my greatest fan. She listened to every sh radio show and every program and everything. I don't know if Aunt Minnie ever knew what I taught. <laughs> but Aunt Minnie so loved me that she just wouldn't miss one of my programs. So, so good listening to us. Well, Aunt Minnie, what did you get out of it? Oh, I just so enjoyed listening to you. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the brain people call this acquired value, but it's basically what I'm getting to is suppose God looks at you with absolute and total delight when he sees you. All right? What's going to happen to me if I'm tracking a mutual mind state with God and he looks at you? And he looks at you. And he looks at you. And he looks at you. And 
I'm not sure what you see there, but clearly, like Aunt Minnie, this is going to be something delightful. And if we learn to see each other that way, we are seeing something that no one on earth is looking at right now. Because they probably aren't seeing the same thing that God's seeing that makes him so delighted to see you. But wouldn't you like to find out what that is? Now we've got a dynamic that could drive us deeper and deeper into what we call fellowship with one another because I'd really like to find out why God seems to be so delighted every time he sees you. My brain starts out always not all that delighted to see you. When I went one time, uh, my first time to Korea, uh, now I, I had grown up, my wife's from Africa, uh, I look at African people, I go, oh, wow, ah, they're interested, I know how to relate to them, those Latin people, I look at them. <laughs> North American people with little practice, I learned how to relate to them, Scandinavian, European, but I had had no exposure whatsoever to Asian people. And I'd read a little bit about Asian people, mostly in English literature about the inscrutable uh, faces and all these other sorts of things, and you can never know what they're thinking and stuff like that. And I, uh, <coughs> Using the mutual mind state with all these different writers, you know, what would now be called very stereotypic material and all that sort of stuff. But looking at all, all these people, they did not look at this experience of going to Asia as a very positive one. Or people you couldn't find you know, anyone to relate to over there. So I'm, I'm going over there with this blank and I'm supposed to make a presentation to a, a very large church in Asia with about 100,000 members, something like that. And I'm not really sure why I'm there. Or what do you tell them? You know, I mean, that's going to have to go through a translator. Uh, one of my friends who uses it, he's, he says, he uses the word interpreter, and he says, he says, they're interrupters. <laughs> I have to go through an interrupter. Um, talking to people whose culture I have no, no knowledge of whatsoever. And, and, and I'm supposed to, you know, be brilliant and uh, useful, and I'm thinking, I don't even understand who I'm talking to, how I'm supposed to be brilliant and useful. And so I was having, trying to do a mutual mind sight with God, like, I know you got me into this mess. What do you want me to see? And the answer came back rather clearly. It's not always real, real clear, but this time it was real clearly. Uh, it was a thought, but not a thought in the sense of a conscious thought. It was like a, an awareness. Uh, so I'd say it's, you know, the fast track kind of awareness. That, and how I would put it in words is, I want you to meet your family you've never met. <laughs> All right? This is what you're here for. Now my brain is registering, I don't know any of these faces, but I remember that, that's what happened when I went to meet my wife's family, right? I don't know any of these faces. But behind these faces are the family I've never met. And if that's actually what it's like, then we have to continue to say, well, how does, how does daddy see him? Help me to see what you see here. And when you do that, then all of a sudden, all kinds of barriers come out of the way. And you may not know how to put it in words, but that's what a mutual mind time can do. It changes our responses instead of trying to control our reactions. So, in fact, once I was looking at these people and something inside of me says I'm looking at family, something inside of me actually responded different to meeting people as I walked down the hall. It was sort of amazing to look at it, like, how did that change? But if you are walking up to somebody going, <coughs> I know we're related, I'm not sure how. <laughs> With that framework in your mind, your, your responses just change. You're, you're not like, okay, what am I going to say and, and how do I communicate since I don't know the language? All those anxiety things, it's like, well, they're still there, sort of, but it's like, okay, now, who are you and, and how are we related and what, what does that mean? The brain is already doing something very, very different. You see, it's changed my initial response in a way that I, I couldn't have intentionally done it if I just wanted to try to, to be that way. And it finds and, and um, activates undiscovered identity. So one of the things that happens again at the, at the right oral prefrontal cortex, the blue spot up at the top of your brain, is mostly mirror neurons 
uh, in the identity section of it. Uh, but they're unable to, as uh, Shaw would say, your identity center is unable to look at itself. You only can understand who you are by looking in the faces of the people around you and seeing how they see you. That's the, how the mechanism is set up. So we see ourselves, or we understand ourselves, by how other people see us. Now, to give you an example, I have, uh, I am, I've always been the family dummy. Yeah, no, quite seriously, I'm the family dummy. I was told, as a child, you cannot participate in the family discussions because you're not as smart as the rest of the family. Right? And on top of that, when I went to school, my spelling was bad, and, and the rest of the students in my grade concluded that it was quite true I couldn't spell as fast as well as they could. In fact, um, when I got a word right, that was sort of remarkable. Uh, and my brain was always saying, um, but you said the word this way, shouldn't it be written this way? When I, when I, um, I, I started writing love letters to my wife by the time I'm, I'm in 18 years old and I always wrote, said S-A-Y-E-D and she would laugh and tell me that's not how it's written but my brain just said it should be S-A-Y-E-D because you say and you said, it's the past tense and, uh, but it, you know, and, but obviously a dummy as far as my school was concerned, as far as my grades were concerned, as far as my teachers were. They can't teach this guy to, to spell and my math skills were similarly limited because they would ask me questions. You know, Mary has uh, seven apples and Bill has three apples and now if you give you know these apples to here how many would you know that person have and I'd go like now why is a person with fewer apples giving their apples to this <laughs> one over here? Because that just doesn't seem right. Now, if they put their apples together and they say, well, what's the answer? So, I'm not sure. So, there's a dummy. Okay. Uh, it, but I was off, off lost in some other track. And, and uh, so, you see, evidence like this mounted. I remember when I was getting ready for college, my dad sat me down and he said to me, now, he says, you're not as smart as the rest of the family. So we don't know that you'll ever be able to complete college, but you know, God has a plan for everybody, so I'm sure you'll find some way to make a use of your life. So you look at all of that evidence and all of the, you know, this various troubles I'd had in school, I nearly, uh, uh, well, I had to repeat first grade. Well, I'll tell you right there. Uh -huh. And then I nearly failed uh, sixth grade uh, and, um, you know, you need any more proof, you know. Uh, except that, of course, it, it never made me feel joyful to understand that I was the family dummy. Something about that always irritated me a little bit. But it wasn't until somebody started to see something else in me that all this weight of evidence maybe wasn't quite the right conclusion, or at least that how smart or dumb I was didn't actually uh, influence what God wanted to do with my life, right? There's some other meaning to it that, you know, I remember one college professor uh, said to me, I had turned in some essay, which was terribly misspelled, I'm, I know. Um, he said, wow, uh, you've got some skill as a writer. And I looked at him like he must surely be out of his mind because couldn't he tell, I mean, I didn't know which words, but I knew there were misspelled words on that page. And how could you be a writer if you can't spell, right? But he was insistent upon it. I thought for sure he was tripping on something. You know, it was in those days in, 70, in the 70s. And I, I knew he had an occasional beer, so he must have been hung over now to come to reach this conclusion, but he saw something in there, and it's actually people like that along the way that saw something in me that drew out something that I didn't think was there, and I actually had some pretty good proof it wasn't there, right? So I, I, every time somebody uh, uh, says, wow, you know, I'm just impressed by all the things you understand, my brain runs this little story through, like, yeah, didn't catch me being a dummy, did you? <laughs> Because, uh, you know, those old messages are still around, but they have no power anymore because other people have seen other things. And yet, 
You know, the interesting thing, I, when, uh, at, when I did my 40 years of being at Fuller, I mean, at, at um, 40 years at, at uh, Shepherd's House, and they gave me a little dinner, I was thinking, what should I say? I remember having a, had a conversation with God about the whole life model thing and how, why he had entrusted it to me, the family dummy. It was kind of the context of this discussion. And God said to me, you weren't my first choice. <laughs> But you said yes. Amen. And I realized then at a very different level that none of this came down to how smart I was. And in fact, why most of the things I'm entrusting to you are entrusted to me and when they're entrusted to you they'll be yours and you'll entrust them to someone else and someone else will say to you, wow, you're really smart. But the really smart one is the one who's pouring through us and through each other all of these things we need to have for a full life. And if we say yes, we're part of the smartest mutual mind system in the world. And what could be cooler than that? So this is, you know, again, what we're back into. If we're tuned in to the big mind and to all of the resources you put in each other, we can think so much more than anyone could even imagine ahead of time. And we will discover an undiscovered identity, you know. Um, in again going back to high school I still to this day don't know where the cafeteria was in my high school I was so afraid to go in there because they'd have to have a conversation with people and I didn't know how to relate to them that nobody in my high school would believe that this guy is teaching relational skills let alone joy with anybody <laughs> they go wilder I don't think I remember him oh that weirdo that stood in the hall yeah which it might be as much as anyone knew about me in high school because I had none of these skills and I couldn't do any of this stuff and I would never have imagined it but this undis undiscovered identity you know that we share together that we build up together this is because someone is finding in me what God put in there and I get to do the same thing with you and how how delightful could that be for all kinds of folks that we don't think uh, have a chance but the point is, when we're using the conscious mind track, which is slower, we can never use it to prove that we're right about what our fast track is thinking, because we can't keep up. So there's a sense that we can know things that we can't prove. And that's what makes it hard to live in a world of people that want you to prove everything with the Bible verse or something else. When we can know things about God faster than we can prove them because we're relying on a system that runs too fast for conscious thought. <coughs> and we have to, we'll only enter into this mutual mind state with someone that's glad to be with us. So if you're not tracking me and you're not glad to be with me, I am not going to do mutual mind state with you. Which means that the only people that can actually find my identity teach me to be someone that I wasn't, teach me to learn these relational skills, is someone who's glad to be with me when I don't know how to do it right. In other words, I look to their brain like an enemy. Like, you're not the kind that's fun to be around. You are the least sociable person in our high school. You're the last person I want to be caught on a date with. Right? Only someone who's glad to be with me can teach me something else. So we must be people who come in glad to be with somebody that no one else would be glad to be with. Someone who basically, to our mind, is our enemy. They are an alien, you know, unpleasant experience to us. They don't know how to do relationship. Why would we be glad to be with them? Our brain won't do it straight up. Because they're not glad to be with us, they're in fact annoying. On a good day, they're annoying. Unless we happen to see them the way Dad sees them. You're glad to be with them. And if I, you acquire that value for me, my mind can actually be glad to be with you while it's figuring out why. I don't know why God, Dad's glad to be with you, but I can see it on his face. He looks at you and goes, yeah, that's my boy, that's my girl. I look right there, like, I want you to, I want you to get to know them. Yes? Okay, so I think what you're saying 
United States with other people, we're not going to know who we are. Is that right? All right. So, may I quote that on, on tape? <laughs> if we don't into, enter into joyful, mutual mind states with other people, we will not know who we are. Correct. And if we don't enter into mutual, joyful mind states with God, we won't know who other people are. If we don't enter into mutual, mind, joyful, mutual mind states with God, we will not know who other people are. They'll just be the enemy, well said. Now they often think they're, that we're their enemy too, right? But we don't take that very seriously. In fact, if we look at Dad, we don't take it seriously at all. Because when he looks at them, he doesn't see his enemy. So, uh, and when he looks at us, he doesn't see his enemy. So why should I buy into the fact that you think you are? Like, what's the validity of that? You're clearly crazy. You need to be able to see what we see around here, right? And then now really everything else we have to say is, is done. Because it's all an outflowing of that particular dynamic right there. And we have to get used to the fact that we are not we'll never quite be aware of what's happening in the fa fast track. It'll always be a little bit out of our reach. So we can never prove that what we heard was God. We can never prove that we exactly understand who we are or who you are. Because we didn't get to that deductively. Our deductive mind is trying to catch up with what we're learning and what we're seeing and what we're understanding and what we're sharing from these mutual mind states. But what we can be quite sure is that if we got it wrong, we won't have peace. Because the fast track of your brain actually puts everything together. And if everything fits together, it's all in the right place at the right time and the right amount, and all the information, all the pictures, all of those things fit together coherently. It's synchronized, is what we would call it. So that, that picture, just everything about it seems true and makes sense. We feel peaceful. We go like, wow, no, I just know. I just feel peaceful. I do, yeah. I can't explain it to you, but I have a peace that passes understanding. I just, you know, for all, you know, I just know. I understand these things. And because there's two ways to achieve that. Um, I can get to a peaceful place if I make everything agree with me. It's called narcissism. <laughs> but here's the fun thing about that. It doesn't produce peace for anybody around me. I can be completely sure that I'm right and everything I see about the world is just the way I said it is and I, I can so harmonize every thought with my own that I am completely convinced that I am the one that knows and I am the one and I, that everything is, but not a person around me is going to go, wow, that really just fits for me. They're all going to go, I don't know, it's annoying. I don't, are you going to tell them? I don't want to tell them. <laughs> so you cannot, you know, this is the wonderful thing about it. You can maybe make your universe all agree with you, but you can't get any other mind to go along with it. You maybe get a couple of minds to cover it up. You can get a few people out of vested interest in making you think you're right. But if you get down to their heart of hearts inside, they're going like, nah, he's full of crap. <laughs> they won't say it. Have you ever watched them walking behind, you know, the center of the universe? And they're going, yeah, this guy's full of crap. <laughs> You can be real attached, yes, oh yes. Your attachment center doesn't really care. I mean, it's a, this is my person, I'll, you know, I'll follow them to hell. But it's, uh, uh, the, the process still doesn't bring shalom, it doesn't bring peace. And so we were thinking, you know, where is this synchronization in the Bible? Until we started looking at the word shalom. And shalom actually means everything in the right place at the right time and the right amount so that both God and people look at it and go, that's right. 
And the interesting thing about the brain is there is a spot on the right brain that's uh, right above the ear out here in the temporal lobe, which happens to be connected to the banana inside, so it's got a banana function, but it's actually out on the outside, that is the part of your brain that looks at things and goes, that doesn't fit. Something about that doesn't add up. And when that signal is on, something about that doesn't add up, you can change your mind. But if that signal is off, you can't change your mind. So if in fact da damage that part of the brain, you will maintain the same opinions for the rest of your life. You will not be able to change your mind about something. You'll be locked into everything that you believe just the way it was at the point that that part got damaged. But the nice thing about it is that provided that you still have your brain there, if you have been thinking anything that isn't true, that doesn't shalom for you, as long as it doesn't shalom, it's always open to change. It's always looking for a potentially better explanation that would shalom. Now change doesn't always mean it's better. I mean, I can go from one bad explanation to a worse explanation. That, that's possible. Well, the worse explanation won't shalom either. And we're talking explanation about who we are. We're not talking about explanation about dark matter and physics and whether or not colliding neutrino stars do stuff like that. We can let a lot of that information just float right past us and we don't really lose our shalom. But you want to talk to me about who I am. And you say, well, you know, you're mostly a worthwhile person, but this part of your... Uh, your life, you know, neither God, saints, nor angels would like, and you know, it, and you really despise that about you. If I can prove to you that you've been doing all those things, it'll feel totally true to you, but you won't shalom about it. Every time I bring it up, you will go, you won't go like, oh, finally someone understands me. I just feel so close. And it'll always be open to something that would make better sense. That's a closer part of truth. And once you have that, this is interesting even about uh, trauma. Once you've processed the trauma to the point where you know who you are and what you and your people would do about that trauma, if it ever happens again, you are not traumatized because you know who you are. And you can do that to me again if you want to, but it isn't gonna change who I am. I'll just hurt because that's who I am. I'm a person that hurts about that kind of stuff. You know, you, you can't do that to someone with my kind of soul without getting a lot of pain. I'm not going to deny that. But you know what? I'd like me a lot less if I didn't hurt about that. So just to give you a little example, with two counselors in my, my office, um, both of them had a miscarriage. Well, they were both husbands, so their wives that technically did it, but they, they lost a child, right? The one child went into the hospital where the miscarriage had happened, and the doctor uh, said to him, you've lost a child, and uh, it was actually very late term. So he says, you're gonna have to arrange a, a funeral. He says, well, why, why can't you put it in the dumpster? It says it was never alive anyway. Um, and his wife you know, looked much worse than you do about the whole situation right there. The other counselor had a miscarriage much earlier in the pregnancy. But we were talking about a couple of years later and he started to cry. And uh, one of the other counselors uh, sensitively said to him, now, you're a counselor, shouldn't you be over it by now? It's been two years. And he became fairly angry about that. And he said, you know what? One of the best things about me is that I'm a father. And every day I don't have that child is a day I don't have a chance to be a father. And I wouldn't like me nearly so well if it didn't bother me like this. So now I ask you, which of these two responses hurts like you think a father should hurt. And which one of them do you like better? Yeah, who would you rather be with? Pick your counselor. And so you see what we have here is that once I know who I am and how it's like me to hurt, I wouldn't like me nearly as well if this wasn't the sort of thing that bothers me. I'm not going to give up letting this bother me. Because that would mean I'm the kind of person I don't want to be, you see. And all of a sudden we've got something, no, I mean, pain won't take that away. We won't run away from that way of feeling, you know. Jesus just happens to be the kind of person 
that can look at Jerusalem and cry over them because they won't come to him. You know, frankly, I'd go to New York. <laughs> Jerusalem didn't like me. <coughs> right? If you don't like me in Austin, hey, I'm going to San Antonio. <laughs> because I, I'm not enough like Jesus. You see, Jesus wouldn't leave Austin and go, well, you know, those people down, down, down there don't like me. I'm just the kind of person that couldn't go to Austin and love them and have them not love me back and let that be okay with me. And just move on to another city. I, I couldn't do it. I'm not that kind of God. See? It's what we like. It's, there's, we like people who heard about the right things. And so when your brain understands that, it puts the picture together. You see? You can't change that. Your brain is now stable. It, it may hurt. But you see, it all makes sense to me. I know why I hurt this way. It makes sense. I wouldn't hurt any other way if I wasn't the kind of person I am. So I will go through life, and if, you wanna, if you're going to make me hurt that way, I, I'd ras ask you not to. I'll, you know, it's not like I'm going to let this happen. But I'm not going to let that change who I am. That's why it's no longer trauma. It's now suffering. And there's a huge difference between trauma and suffering. In suffering, you go on being the person you were, created to be. In trauma, I stop being who I am right now in the hopes that the pain will go away. So uh, we're back to um, my lecture here. The way this mutual mind state works so that we can have other people join us in our experience um, and help us understand who we are is that the left side of the right side of your brain communicates with the opposite side of your body, right? So it puts whatever it's really feeling on the left side of your body, which is mostly your face. Then if I look at your face, uh, my visual field is split down the middle of my retinas. So the left side of the retina of both eyes sends all of the information to the right side of the brain. So when I'm looking at you, all of the information about the right, si right side of your brain, which is on the left side of your face, is going to the left side of the retinas of my eye, which is going to the right side of my brain. <coughs> so it's a very interesting way that the brain flips sides back and forth like that, so that the right side of your brain sends a message directly to the right side of my brain. If I look at my own face in the mirror, it gets flipped backwards. So the right side of my brain gets sent to the left side of my brain. And in sense of the, this kind of communication, nothing happens. That's why I can't build joy by smiling at myself in the mirror. I can go in there and look and smile and they're like, okay, you ready to quit yet? Um, you know, huh, oh, lettuce in my teeth. Mm. Um, <laughs> So if you have a sender and a receiver, what ends up happening is I send the signal over there, but then immediately the brain switches roles. So my right brain has something to say about what your right brain just said, and it sends a signal back to you. Now that entire cycle uh, completes six times in a second. So that's what we mean by it's, it's a sixth of a second. It sends a message to you, you send a message back to me, that's a sixth of a second. I'm already sending the next message to you before my conscious mind has had the first awareness that anything is happening. Remember, that takes a fifth of a second. So uh, this, you're, you're getting my second message and I don't know that we're talking yet. This is why uh, it can synchronize brain activity. This goes so fast that your brain and my brain soon start having the same reactions. We start creating the same chemicals because in order to feel the same thing, we have to create the same, so it's joy chemicals or anger chemicals or fear chemicals or whatever it is. My brain is now juicing up to look like yours. And if my brain is growing, I will actually grow a, my, a stronger part of my brain using whatever I've been exercising with you. So uh, I'm born with all of these potentials in my brain to grow, but the ones that actually grow are the ones that get stimulated and used. So if when I'm practicing with you growing my brain, I'm doing all this joy and, and uh, 
quieting exercise. I'm just growing massive joy and quiet structures. But I won't do that unless you already have them. Otherwise, whatever you're using to exercise my brain doesn't have joy and quiet structures in it. It's got anxiety structures. It's got depression structures. I'll duplicate your depressed chemi chemistry if that's what you want to practice with me. I'll duplicate your anxious. It wasn't because I was genetically predisposed to it, even if my family line goes back years and years of having this. It's because that's what we've practiced with each other. And so when I had to duplicate something, uh, my be like stuff had anxious people to be like. And now it's got all of the structures and uh, the chemistry, everything you need to be anxious. I have developed from you know my, my first interactions with other people. I've strengthened those systems uh, tremendously. Uh, and because it goes faster than the conscious mind, it's authentic and truthful. So if someone comes to my office or my church or something like that, and I want them to think they're welcome, but my actual reaction to them is not joyful, it's like, oh, they're back. But my, my uh, conscious mind is a good pastor and therapist is, oh, I'm supposed to be welcoming them to here. <coughs> My face will have already sent them a message. They will talk back to me. I'll send, be sending them the next, like, oh, crap, not you again today. <laughs> and my, my conscious mind is going to be going, oh, it's, yes, okay. Well, let's bring on the pastor here. Uh, and I will bring that on. They'll go, like, something tells me that's not authentic. Right? right? I think I've pulled it off because my conscious mind didn't track the other conversation we had, <laughs> right? It, did, it didn't know that was going on. But they're going, yeah, I don't know what it is with that pastor. He's full of it, you know, it's like he comes and smiles, acts like he likes me, but I know he doesn't. Um, and because emotions are amplified each cycle, the thing that you can do to distinguish real joy from like I'm just feeling happy is that it amplifies with another mind. If it's not amplifying with another mind, you're not building joy. So each, if, and the way you know it's amplifying with another mind is after about six to 10 seconds, you're ready for a break. Like, I think I, my face is gonna crack if I don't take a break now, you see. <laughs> it's not those wedding picture smiles, right? It's like, wow, oh, how are you doing? You know, you have all these little, little breaks that let us, you know, bring the energy back down again. That's what we're trying to exercise right there. And everyone is subjectively experiences produced by the other. So you'd say, well, you're making me smile. So no, you're making me smile. When in fact, it's us making us smile here. So mutual mind states travel at the speed of joy. Yeah, that's a saying I made up myself. They're created with those that love, they form our identity, they shape our character, they determine our reactions. They regulate our emotions and, and motivation. And so um, when I, my response to you is, you're someone I love, my, even my reactions to the annoying things about you uh, are secondary to my first reaction being, you know, but I love you, I care about you. Why can you be so annoying? Because people can be. I mean, you're looking at me, like you don't believe me, but. I, I, I have it on good evidence. People can be annoying, even people you love. But the fundamental reaction to them is, you know, I really love and care about you. Can't we stop being so annoying? As opposed to, you're just so annoying. And maybe I can try to act like I like you, but, you know, the, it's, we're talking about something, again, that determines my reactions. What's the most, the deepest, most fundamental reaction? Uh, comes out of this sense of who we love and who we're connected with. Then uh, we go over to the left side of the brain, uh, crossing the, uh, the middle of the brain, or your little pathway going over here, passes this information about um, whether you're important to me, whether you're good, bad, or scary, uh, what we share with other people, what it would be like me and my people to do under these conditions. This one-sixth of a second condition, all right? This updates every sixth of a second. So who am I and what it would be like us to do now is for this one-sixth of a second. It's always in real time. It's always us right now. 
as conditions change, that signal changes all the time. So this is not like a static thing, like we've now landed on the one and only thing I think and think and feel and respond and do with you right now. It's like under these conditions, this is how we act. It's always being updated very fast. And then level five, we would call it, um, sometimes we call it four plus, because if level, the first four levels aren't working, you don't get the plus. So we've just gone back and forth. Do we call it level five or level four plus? Um, when you get there, then this question is, how do I put this into words? How do I express it? How do I explain it? How do I interact with it? How do I look it over and make sure that this is working right? All of those analytic functions uh, that happen on the slow track at conscious speed uh, start in and we start looking over our experience. So. The fa fast mutual mind, and you should have this in your notes right there. Six cycles a second creates identity, shapes the brain, imitates others, determines how we act, takes all that we know into account, and then conscious thought runs at five cycles per second, explains what happens, makes plans, finds thought, words for thoughts, determines what we say, focuses on what we can explain. And all of those are important functions, right? So we want to have a whole brain involvement in things under the leadership of the um, uh, right hemisphere. Quick yeah. Um, are all those going to be parallel to one another, or are they just points um, in that last, last slide? Uh, yeah, they're all descriptive characteristics of. Uh, the two systems. Okay, so it's not like six cycles to five, it's not like creates and then explains what happened. They don't, they don't No, they're, they're not intended to, uh, you know, be the, the mirror function on the other side. They're just the characteristics of that. Uh, I mean, a few of them, obviously, you can see where they, but don't try to make your brain put the other ones together. Yeah. yeah. You, you would, yes, yes. If you come up with something, it'd be really brilliant. I'd love to see it. But. Okay, so what we're going to do um, at some point here, and we're not going to do it, uh, it'll probably be what we're doing tomorrow, we're actually going to build a brain out of spare parts. <laughs> and we're going to actually simulate how we would respond to different things by, by moving it through the brain and having, like, you know, each of you, we might have these four tables over here, B level one, two, three, Four and then the other side of the brain uh, over here, and we'll see what we'll see what happens when you put the brain under different conditions. But uh, we're going to wait for that stimulation uh, for tomorrow. The thing we want to remember is that it runs in different directions. So on the on the right side of the brain, it goes from the back to the front and puts together a picture of who I am, and then the left side it goes from the front to the back and it tends to take apart this experience and figure out which cubby hole I'll put it in, how I'll explain it, what words I'll use for it, uh, how I will categorize what's going on. They're both very functional but they're, they're almost opposite processes that are going on. Now the other thing that we call the right side of our brain is uh, we call them our relational circuits which you again heard about over the weekend and uh, here's the tests that we we use. Again, remember we're trying to figure out a low-tech implementation of a high-tech theory, right? So we've got these wonderful brain scans for Dr. Amen, $3,000 a crack. Uh, it takes a while to do them. And if we want to make sure that your relational circuits, your right prefrontal cortex is up and running, we could have you get your scan from Amen for $3,000 every time we wanted to know if it was up and running. <laughs> Like, okay, we want to train you today. The part of you that's you is your prefrontal cortex. Is it on? All right? Let's send you in 3000 bucks. It'd be rather tedious, right? And it also doesn't work very well in Sudan or southern Mexico or places like that. So what are some of the tests that you can use to look at something and say, is that part of the brain on? Well, um, Here's one of those things that I just think reflects God's planning or sense of humor. I've yet to decide exactly which. Um, but 
I went to work at the VA hospital when I was an intern, uh, going back to my internship experiences here. And I'm kept letting this catch up with me. Okay. <clears throat> um, and everybody wanted to be in the psych ward. That's where you wanted to go and really deal with all the psych patients and everything like that. And if you got real unlucky, you got put in the neuropsych evaluation unit. And you had to do neuropsych tests on everybody and write up eight to 12 page reports. So all you did was do these assessments and write reports. And, and guess what Lucky Wilder drew? Neuropsych assessment ward treatment. At the time we used the Luria, Nebraska. Now some of you know Luria, the great uh, Russian neurologist. Uh, he basically spent his life career figuring out what every little part of the brain did and a test to find out if it was working or not. So we would do things like we would put, uh, you know, four different objects in a cloth bag and we'd have someone reach in with their left hand and identify the objects and uh, then you put them on this side and we, you know, we had hundreds of these tests, you know, down the, you know, the pitch uh, tuning forks and, you know, and all, I mean, everything you wanted to test, test the nervous system. <laughs> when it would get done, we would say to the, uh, uh, the neurosurgeons, okay, this person has a tumor growing in such and such a place that's affecting the following regions. See if you can find it on the x-ray machine. And if not, here's where you go do your surgery. And then after they did the surgery, they come back to us and we do an assessment to find out how many other things they damaged that they didn't intend to when they went to do the surgery. Um, and we go, well, it looks like you got that, but you also got this and you got that. And, yeah, too bad, you poor sucker will be blind. Uh, well, he can actually see with his eyes, the signal gets back to here and then it doesn't go any farther. You know, it's like, okay, you, you cut that one, didn't you? That wasn't good. Uh, but that was the lovely rotation nobody wanted, right? But what was I learning to do? I was learning a really low-tech way of identifying if any given spot in the brain was actually running or not. Was it getting a signal? And what sequence did they get through? Because if it went to here, uh, and you said, well, I got it this far, but it didn't get over here, you know the damage was in between them, right? Well, there's a few things that the right orbital prefrontal cortex does that no other part of the brain does. And so if you can uh, check those easily enough, you know if it's on or off. It's kind of rough, I mean, because every part of the brain can be sort of on or sort of off. Or <coughs> but if you can sustain it over time, or like a few minutes, you know it's pretty well on. So I mean, even those things you can, you can check on. So, one of the things about the right oral prefrontal cortex is it's the only part of your brain that can tell you how something is feeling in your body right now. Now again, it's not, it doesn't do that directly. There's other systems involved, right? But um, it can tell you what's going on in your body. So um, what I would do uh, then for a simple test is um, Let's think of something you like and tell me how it feels in your body when you're thinking about that. Something you appreciate, something you're, you like. Think of a coffee or, or anything you happen to like. Now think, can you feel what it feels like inside your body? Not, and not necessarily whether you can put words to it, because that's another part of your brain, but yeah, can you feel that inside? What does it feel like to you to feel relaxed? Or what does it feel like to you to feel any, any good feeling? Now, why do we do good feelings? Create joy and? Hmm? Turns that area on. Yeah, turns that area on, yes. And also, what happens if I load a negative feeling into the right side of the brain? It has a tendency to shut it down, right? So I don't want to say, you know, let's remember something really hurtful and can you tell me what's going on inside your body? Because the chances are I just shut off the circuit I want to have on. Right? Because I'm bringing a picture of something you really appreciate. Or if nothing else, I say, would, would you rather have, uh, what would you like to drink? Would you rather have some water, some juice, some coffee, some tea? Now the interesting thing there is I'm running a different test. 
the only part of your brain that can actually state a preference is your right orbital prefrontal cortex. So I could ask you the question, what should you wear on a cold day? And you could answer that question without your prefrontal cortex. What should you wear on a cold day? Hmm? Something warm, warm clothes, all right? Okay, that's a problem solving part of the brain. You know, what you wear in cold days, warm clothes. Okay, that's good, you're, you know, your problem solving <laughs> is on, but is your right orbital prefrontal cortex? I said, of, of, of your warm clothes, which one do you like best? Your problem solving cortex can't do that. Now we're talking personal preference. So it said, well, do you like your blue sweater or your red sweater? And you say, well, I think the blue is warmer, then I still have a pretty good chance that you're just answering what's the warmest thing to wear on a cold day. You're not asking which do you prefer. If I said, well, what do you really like? About, do you like anything about blue? Oh, yeah, man, I let, I let blue is like my favorite color. Anything that expresses a preference, I'm now activating this part of the brain. I know your right prefrontal cortex is on or you couldn't answer that question. See, these are very subtle tests. But if you want to go again to uh, Sudan, can you ask people uh, of their preference? Do you uh, prefer a mango or a papaya? Oh, I like mangoes. Well, for this moment, you have your right orbital prefrontal cortex on. I said, well, what does it feel like inside when you get to drink something? Oh, that's, you know, cooling and refreshing and all that sort of. Now, I know we've got this system running. Save me $3,000 in a... In a shipping it off to uh, Dr. Amen. Uh, now when you actually go out to teach somebody, do you teach them all the reasons why we, we run these little tests? And the answer is no. But we know there's a reason for doing them and people will often say to you, well, uh, to be a Christian, why do I need to know what's inside my body? You know, how it feels like inside my body. Isn't that like some psychology thing or another? And this is a little test for the brain, you know, to find out what's going on. But, uh, again, this is the, the context of trying to do these. So the, the relational circuits test, I want to make a problem, person, or feeling go away. Okay. The go away is the reaction of level two. That's bad and scary, I just want to go away. If that's dominating, you know you're not getting a lot of prefrontal activity. I don't want to listen to what other people are saying. You're saying nothing, level three is not up and running. Because if I want to really listen, I want to know what's going on in your mind. Level three is running and the information is getting to the front of my brain. It's like, I want to have a mutual mind state with this person. I'm really curious about what's going on with them. That shut off, I can be quite sure the signal isn't getting to level four. It's eff effectively off. Um, my mind is locked onto something upsetting. Again, a level two reaction. I don't want to be connected to someone I usually like. So. Let's get down to level one. Can you sense any signal whatsoever coming out of level one? So level one normally likes somebody, you get a signal? I mean, that's what we're asking, right? Uh, no, I don't want to be with them. Do you usually like them? Well, yeah, but not right now. I'm not, not, not right now. Not if they're going to be that way about it. They're not, I don't, you know. Uh, you know, you, you see how you've effectively checked to see is a signal getting from level one to level four. If it isn't, Level four isn't being effective. We don't know where along the way it got stuck because we're not being that sophisticated. But if we want to teach people's level four anything, it's got to be getting a signal before we go on with it. Or I want to get away, uh, fight or freeze. You recognize the amygdala responses there, level two. They're dominating things. That's all I'm thinking about. Or I want to aggressively interrogate, judge or fix others. This is a clever one because that means level, your right hemisphere, your fast track is so offline that your left hemisphere is ready to take over and you're going to, uh, you, are, you are going to make people think the way you want them to think. This is between my thinking smart and your thinking stupid. And so our relationship has no relevance to this. It's just my left hemisphere is going to hammer the pulp out of yours till you quit being stupid and getting in my way. So we know right hemisphere is down for the count or you wouldn't be having this response. So these are how these tests are actually designed to work and, and why they're 
they're effective, but you notice they're all slightly different tests for looking at the same system, knowing is a signal getting through? Can you detect it? Uh, and they're, they're different in how they go about testing it. So it's not just a series of questions. You understanding that? But they're all ways of trying to find out the same thing. Have I got my uh, right hemisphere up and running in the way that I need it to be? So 